Um, and we've also got Natalie and Rob here tonight to help us hopefully present you with some um, information and answer some of your questions around NCA. So, um, Matt, did you want to introduce yourself? Um, kia ora everyone, my name's Natalie Guinness and I'm the Head of Careers here and I'm a newbie really as well. I've been here a year, so just a bit longer than now. Um, but hopefully tonight we'll be able to give you a bit more of um, an insight into NCA. But at any point, if you've got any questions, it's, we're hopefully going to make it quite informal. Please don't hesitate to ask us. Hi, my name's Rob Lay and I'm the uh, Principal's nominee. So I take care of all the, uh, anything to do with NCEA uh, assessments and moderations and I'll chip in as we go along and have a little bit more to say about that. Yes. I think we'll go on to the, just to let you know that this website, um, this, will, this will also answer a lot of your questions. So www.nzqa.gov.nz um, and there's student access on there but there's also a lot of information on there for parents. If we just go to the next slide, Nat, we are going to show you a short video. Kia ora. hello. This film is designed to help you understand NCEA, the main qualification for secondary school kids in New Zealand. NCEA stands for the National Certificate of Educational Achievement, and it comes in three levels, cleverly named 1, 2 and 3. The key ingredients in NCEA are things called standards and credits. One leads to the other. With NCEA, there are still important national exams at the end of the year. We sometimes call it external assessment. But you can also be tested or assessed throughout the year. That's called internal assessment because it happens in school. It may sound like a lot more work, but let's face it, there are some things you can't test in a sit-down exam. Why write about delivering your mihi in te reo Māori when you could do it for real? Why just write about a science experiment when you could do the experiment in the lab and see the real results? With NCEA, subjects are divided up into all the things you need to know. They're called standards. Each standard is worth credits, and credits count towards the final qualification. It means that instead of doing a three-hour exam on the whole subject of English, you could be assessed in separate standards about writing a business letter, analysing a text, making a film and giving speech. Some of these will be tested in an exam at the end of the year and some will be assessed during the year. To get NCEA, you need to get enough credits, 80 at each level. At levels 2 and 3, 20 of the 80 credits can be from any level. You also need to achieve a minimum number of literacy credits, writing, speaking and listening skills, and numeracy credits, number, measurement and statistical skills. But these can be gained in a large number of different subjects. You can build up credits during the year, or even over more than one year, and once you've got credits, they last forever. And you can keep track of how many credits you're stacking up as you go along. When you get your results, you'll know how many credits you've got, but your results tell you a lot more than just NCEA Level 1 passed. When you log in to view your results for each standard, a letter will appear next to each one. N. A. M. E. They stand for Not Achieved, Achieved, Merit and Excellence. You can probably guess what Not Achieved means. Achieved, Merit and Excellence tell you how well you did in reaching the standard. One thing to remember is that these days, E is for Excellence. It might pay to let your parents know that, when they were at school, if you got an E, it was bad news. You won't get any more credits for getting merits and excellences, but there are good reasons for aiming high. If you get enough credits with merits or excellences, 50 to be exact, you'll get merit or excellence included in your NCEA qualification. It's called Certificate Endorsement, and everyone will know how well you've done. That will tell people you mean business. It's a good reason to keep aiming for merits and excellences even after you've reached 80 credits. Merits and excellences can also be useful if you're doing well in particular courses or subjects. Course endorsement tells people you're especially good at a particular subject or course. If you get 14 credits with excellence in a particular course, say maths or music, you will have that course endorsed with excellence. Anyone who reads your results will see you've done particularly well at maths or music, or even both. 
That will come in handy when you're showing results to people after you've left school, for work or going somewhere else to study. Vocational pathways are another way you can show what you've learnt. They also suggest the types of study options and job opportunities that you may be interested in looking into. You get a Vocational Pathways Award when you've completed one of the six industry pathways. You can get more than one Vocational Pathway Award. Need A! Eh? You can use Vocational Pathways to show how your achievement relates to the learning or skills employers are looking for. Your time at secondary school is a bit like a journey. It might start off feeling like you're in a foreign land, but you soon start becoming more familiar with the territory and you'll want to explore new places and ideas. Just like any journey, it helps to have an idea of where you want to go and a map so you can plan how to get there. You want to know the subjects you're studying are taking you in the right direction. Getting as many credits as you can is great, but it's important to think about what subjects you're getting credits in. If you're aiming for a job or university course, you need to get credits in the standards that will be useful to employers or that the university will expect to see in your results. Make sure you're on the right path. And remember, just because you've got university entrance doesn't mean you can just turn up for any university course you like. These days, universities want to see lots of ease in your results. Another good reason for aiming high. So, a couple of important things to remember. Make sure the standards you are studying are going to give you the results you need so you can do what you want to do when you leave school. Because NCEA is recognised internationally, it means you can study at an overseas university. And make sure you're getting your best possible results, as many excellences and merits as possible. If you've got questions, talk to the experts, ask your teachers, go to the NZQA website www.nzqa.govt.nz or phone NZQA on 0800 697 296. Okay, so um, what Rob said before is absolutely true. MCA was brought in to change the system that you probably went to school with. So just to give some clarity around how it looks, Year 11 was like the school cert here in New Zealand. Year 12 moved into the sixth form certificate and Year 13 the bursary. Um, and now it literally is NCA Level 1, 2 and 3 to keep it absolutely nice and clear that those are the levels that you're working um, at at certain points. It doesn't mean in year 11, NCA level one is the only thing year 11s might be working on. In some cases, uh, like my daughter at the moment, she's at Kashmir, she's actually doing a level two standard. And in just the same way in year 12, there might be students who are working on some level one standards. So it still can be worked on over different periods of time. But essentially level one, two and three do pretty much follow year 11, 12 and 13. And after level three, looking at university entrance or apprenticeships, trades, other courses that have entry requirements or in some cases employment as well. So in year 11 your daughter will take six subjects and what we've got there is the blue snipped um, image there is two days of a timetable so you can see um, five periods in a day she's got her six subjects she's got English, visual arts, maths, geo, geography sorry um, you're going to have to tell me what tech the F is in that. And science. I think it's fabric tech. Yep. Um, so that will, so with, and within each subject, there will be a number of standards that your daughter will do. And then within the standards, there'll either be internals or externals. Okay, so the internals are the internally assessed standards, externals are the exams at the end of the year. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so internal assessments are graded by teachers in school. There's a whole process around um, assessment in school um, with um, checkpoints in place, with um, submissions, then there's a whole process around resubmissions as well. Okay, so at the start, so within the six subjects your daughter is doing they'll, they'll be working on different standards and, in, and at the start when they, when they begin a new standard they're given what the criteria is to achieve in that standard. So this information is called the assessment criteria and you can see there's three levels of achievement there. Achieved, achieved with merit and achieved with excellence. 
um, there's also not achieved. Okay, so that's when the student doesn't pass the standard. If the student passes the standard, they receive credits. Okay, so each standard is worth a different amount of credits. A lot of standards are worth around four credits. Um, however, practical subjects where you have to produce, for example, an art board um, can be worth up to 20 credits. And that sort of practical task will um, be spread out possibly over a term, um, but definitely much longer than what these, what, when I'm talking about four credit standards, um, when I'm talking about those ones, that will be a shorter time frame. Again, this differs within subject. So at the start of the year or the start of the term, um, it's really important to understand, for the girls to understand, what, what standard is being worked on that term, what their time frame is, how many credits they're going to receive when they pass it, and when the deadline is. So what we've been talking about here are achievement standards. There are also unit standards, and I think that's an extra one, Matt. Yeah. Um, so unit standards, um, for a lot of families get a bit confused to start off with that actually NCA does operate on sort of two levels. There's the achievement standards, which are you know classically taught in the majority of subjects in the school and they can be at a not achieved, achieved merit or excellence level. But there's also unit standards. Now they were um, created sort of to commonly tie in with trades or vocational pathways and the success at that is a not achieved, sorry, not, not a successful, not achieved, or an achieved, and that's all you can actually get for a unit standard, but they do count towards the credits NCA level one, two, and three. So for a lot of students, they have very valuable timetables that have those unit standard pathway courses woven in them, but the credits they get will still count for whatever level of NCA they're doing, but it does not count for a, um, an endorsement. So they won't be getting a merit endorsement or an excellence endorsement at a subject like my directions course at level two, but they will come out probably with 20 credits that go towards level two credits. Yeah. Okay, so I touched on this before. So most standards carry around four credits um, and we're talking about um, practical subjects there. Um, and like Rob mentioned, each subject has around 20 credits available in a year. Okay. Um, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about an assessment calendar. So again, each subject at year 11 and into year 12 and 13, um, you, the girls should understand when their assessments are, what their assessments are, when they do, and how many credits they're going to earn from that course. Girls can add up the amount of credits they're going to receive. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really good, um, you know, task for girls to do to sit down and tell you what the credit, what the sport standards they're doing, how many credits they're worth, and how many think, how many credits they think they're going to earn in, in that year. Um, because I'm going to get to the magic number in a minute, um, which is on the next slide. So at level one in year eleven, they have to earn eighty credits. Um, now, within that level, within that. 80 credits, there has to be 10 credits that are tagged with literacy and 10 credits that are tagged with numeracy. And those literacy and numeracy credits can be earned in all their subjects, not just English, not just maths. So um, within the kite, if you like, of um, credits at level one, there will be 80 credits at level one or higher, including literacy and numeracy. When they move to level two, they carry 20 of those credits over. So at level two, again, they need 80 credits. They've already got 20 from level one. So that leaves 60, and those 60 have to be at level two. And then we move up to level three, and again, we take 20 credits with us from level two, and we need to get 60 credits at level three. Um, I don't know if it's on here, but part of, oh, it might be on the next slide, Nat. University, university entrance. University entrance, yeah. So, I've lost my place in this. So university entrance is the qualification that girls leave with when they leave um, after year 13. And part of university entrance is 
level one that you see in numeracy. At level two, they need to have UE literacy. So backing back a little bit to level two literacy with their 80 credits, within that needs to be some literacy credits as well, um, which is five reading and five writing, and some numeracy at level two. And then at level three, to get UE, they need 14 credits and three approved subjects at level three. That's what universities will be asking for. Um, when you're, and something else to always to, to think about also is when girls are applying for university, if, if they're going down that pathway, um, they have to supply their grades. And they've only got their level two grades to use um, when they make that application. So level two becomes really important in that respect. Yes. Yeah, so what we've um, started to do is um, we're having um, a mini careers expo that we started last year. It got a little bit changed. We were planning on having families in, but because of COVID, we had to uh, you know, make it an in-school thing. What we did was we put out um, subject recommendations for pathways and certain jobs and industries that students might be interested in. And on the Careers Expo, we had all of our subject um, areas available for students to go and talk to. So they were given information about what they'd need to do and what things could lead to what things, so what areas subject-wise could lead to what jobs. And they were given the opportunity of talking to staff. And then we had providers come in from universities, from tertiary providers in Christchurch. And that included National Trades Academy, Vision College, Lincoln University as well, Ada all the sort of biggies that we have around here and students were then able to go and talk to them about pathways and what they'd need and that was prior to subject selection. So that actually worked really well because it meant the students could make sure they got what they needed to get organised as far as their timetable choices ready before they made them. So we'll do that again this year. I'm not entirely sure if we'll, we'll change the format because it was really good and it was really successful. Um, but yeah, absolutely, the students will be given all the information they need to make the right choices. Um, okay, so endorsements. Um, so endorsements are one way um, that kids can kind of stand out, I guess. You, we have a subject endorsement, sorry, and an overall course endorsement. So for a subject endorsement, so remember the girls take six subjects, potentially they can get an endorsement in each subject if they get 14 or more credits um, at merit, 14 or more credits at excellence, where four of them include an exam. They can also get um, uh, subject endorsement um, at achievement too. So if they you know, just sit their externals and get an achievement, and they've got an achievement in which they can get the subject endorsement and achievement level too. So this has been introduced this year. And then you can get an overall endorsement for your course if you if you achieve 50 credits at merit or 50 credits at excellence. Can you get achieved for overall role? That'll be the same too. The same. Okay. Okay. So okay, that's endorsement. All right, Rob, this is you. So um, when it comes to internal assessment, every subject um, has to follow certain procedures. Um, the students will know usually ahead of time when an internal assessment is coming up. And, and usually at the start of the year when the students get their course outline for a subject, it'll state um, in the planning page when these assessments are coming up. And I always say to my students, look, get a, a physical calendar and colour code your subjects and when assessments are coming up. So that it's not a surprise or a shock to you or all your parents that we've got two assessments and one or whatever. Um, so, Every subject will have some form of internal assessment. When it comes to science, it could be um, a, a lab, a two-period lab experiment. Um, uh, in history, it could be a, uh, an essay or an English too. So different subjects have different ways of assessing students as well. Um, it's not like the old days where you used to sit um, in a classroom and you had an hour or three hours to sit at a particular exam or something like that. So things are far more flexible and to meet the requirements of student needs. Um, during um, internal assessment, um, teachers have to get uh, student work moderated, so it's moderated by other teachers in their department, or if there's not another teacher in that subject, 
they will often go off-site to another teacher in another school and look at that group and give their determination as to whether that's the correct grading for those uh, student pieces of work. And then we also have a form of external moderation that takes place every year. Every high school has this. And they randomly pick different standards and different subjects that we send off to external moderators. And they check to see that we're actually uh, keeping the right standard or quality of standard with our um, student work. And that voice occurs um, once a year. And then a report is made for every standard um, that is actually sent in for that too. What else? Um, yeah. So the results are then put up onto um, our uh, KMAR, our MARC system, and students can get access, or parents can get access to that information too. They can see uh, the results coming through on that portal. Um, students will sometimes, uh, if they're not happy with the results that they get, they can come. There is a process that we have at the school where they can come and talk to their teacher, and then if they're not happy with that, talk to the head of that particular department um, to get any redress if they feel that they've been hard done by. We seldom have that uh, because the checking system has done reasonably well here, but that process is there. It's available to students if they need it. Uh, there's a parent portal, and that'll tell you what your daughter has received. We also have school um, practice examinations. Um, things have changed a lot since you went through um, the days of school suit and UE. Um, so not all subjects will offer practice exams, but sometime around term three, halfway through term three, we have um, time set aside for students to sit practice exams in their subjects. And from that, they get derived grades created from that. Now these derived grades are really important for the end of the year exams if they're sick or incapacitated, if they had an accident, um, then we can actually go back to those derived grades and use them to cover their absence from the exam. So it's a really important part of our um, assessment system. Uh, yeah, and those processes are really, they have to be really robust around school um, derived grade exams. I'm thinking back to last year with COVID-19 mm. and the uncertainty around the end of the year last year. Um, it was really important that there was a lot of um, process put into the derived grade exams in case mm. the actual exams at the end of the year couldn't happen. So and students don't know what's going to happen to them if they are sitting in some exams. Um, and we get anywhere between 15 and 25 derived, derived grade applications at the end of the year. And sometimes, and I have, I have to deal with all that process, and it's really frustrating when you see that a student hasn't come to a practice exam, and there's nothing for us to actually fall back on to cover her for her absence from an exam or whatever. So it's important that they do actually take the practice exam seriously. There are alternative um, means of gathering evidence. Um, NZQA has introduced that over the last couple of years. So it's not just a practice exam, there may be other alternative forms of evidence that we can also um, gather for that student in that subject that can act as a derived grade if they do this in the exam for specific reasons. That's me. And so my job essentially is anything to do with NCEA assessments, exams, moderations. That's my whole field. And I have to manage that and make sure that it's, um, uh, I was going to say, is fair, um, is appropriate. Uh, students that have got issues with um, assessments, they will come to me eventually and talk to me about issues and I'll deal with all of those things. Another area that I deal with is um, cheating and plagiarism. That's not a nice thing to talk about. But we often say to students, look, if you're doing any assessment at school, make sure that it's your own work, not somebody else's. And every year we get at least a dozen or more plagiarism cases across my table. And it's really tough to deal with uh, with students over that because they may have made a mistake later at night by looking at another student's work and copying and pasting that onto their assignment, etc. And we have um, a number of um, facilities that we use to cover ourselves. We use Turnitin, a plagiarism software, so that students are meant to use that for themselves, and teachers will also put that work through Turnitin as well. So, um, one thing, if you could, 
I mentioned to your daughter is that whatever assessment work they're doing, it has to be their own work, not someone else's. And if they are um, accessing material from websites, they need to use the appropriate sort of footnoting and bibliography that we're always to. So hopefully we won't have to deal with too many more cases this year. So I think that's just a list of some key people. Um, obviously your daughter's Pawako, um, her form teacher is your first point of contact if you've got any questions or queries that come up. Um, and then the girls have got their kaitiaki or their dean. Um, and so depending on what house they're in, um, that's the next person to go to. And then we've got Natalie, who you've met, um, who is our head of careers. Um, and and myself. Um, so um, my responsibility within all of this is around teaching and learning. So I have overall, um, along with Karen Powell, who's another deputy principal, we have oversight of the teaching and learning at Avonside.